As soon as the wheels of the Southwest plane touched the ground at Sacramento International Airport, Wes Hardaway pulled out his cell phone. Hi, honey, he said cheerfully when his wife Marlene answered. I'm back from San Diego. The plane just landed, so while I'm packing up my things in my car, I'll be home in about an hour. Yeah, I love you too. Bye. Heading down I-80 toward Fair Oaks, the accountant thought again about how much he disliked business travel. Wes didn't get to do it often, but when he did, it was usually for two or three nights, and he hated being away from home for that long. Unfortunately, his boss, Edith Norton, hated traveling even more than he did, so he was the one who had to make the quarterly trip south to represent the Sacramento office. But at least for the next three months, he was done with traveling, and maybe now, he thought hopefully, Marlene would want to start a family. She wanted to wait until her freelance art business was up and running. From what he'd seen of her work, Wes thought she was pretty successful, so he hoped she'd be more open. Working outside the home would make motherhood much easier. At least that was his argument. Driving down the smooth streets of Fair Oaks past rows of neat ranches, he hummed a classic rock tune he'd heard on the airport sound system. But the tune quickly faded away when he pulled into his driveway and discovered that the garage door opener didn't work. Shaking his head in disgust, he parked in the driveway and walked to the front door. To his horror, the key wouldn't go into the lock. He checked to see if he had accidentally mixed up the keys, but no, it was indeed the house key. After trying a few more times, he gave up and rang the doorbell. Not a sound came from inside. He tried again with the same result. Hi, honey, it's me, he shouted through the door. Something's wrong with the lock. Can you let me in? When there was no answer, he knocked sharply on the door with his knuckles, hoping to get Marlene's attention. This time he heard movement inside. Then his wife's voice came from behind the door. The reason your key doesn't work is because I changed all the locks. The garage door code was changed too. He stared at the front door incomprehensibly. I don't understand, Marlene. Let me in. No, Wes, you can't come in. You don't live here anymore. What do you mean I don't live here anymore? Of course I live here. This is my home. What's going on? There was a long pause. Then he heard a faint, It's about time. His wife's voice grew louder. Talk to whoever's behind you. Turning around, Wes saw a faceless man in a baseball cap walking toward him. Before he could speak, the stranger demanded, Are you Wesley Hardaway? Yes, but who... Before he could finish, the stranger shoved an envelope into his hand. Wesley Hardaway, you have been served. But, 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 what's this? This, sir, is a copy of your wife's petition for divorce. Divorce. Quite right, Mr. Hardaway. Furthermore, your wife has asked that a copy of this temporary restraining order be served upon you. It requires you to stay at least 200 yards away from Mrs. Hardaway at all times. What, that's insane. Why would I... Wes cut the words short, turned, and started pounding on the front door. Marlene, let me in. We need to talk about this. What? What seems to be the problem, sir? Came a deep voice from behind him, and Wes turned around to see a Sacramento cop standing on the sidewalk, one hand resting on the holster of his automatic. Before Wes could mutter an explanation, the stranger in the cap spoke up for him. Mr. Hardaway has just been notified that a temporary restraining order has been placed on him, officer. He must move at least 200 yards from his wife's house. With these words, the bailiff approached the officer and handed him a copy of the temporary restraining order. The policeman in the black uniform looked over the form cursorily, then turned to Wes. Sir, you're going to have to leave this place immediately. If you do not, I will be forced to arrest you for violating a court order. He looked at the stunned expression on Wes's face. Sir, do you understand what I said? He had always been taught to respect authority, so Wes blinked a few times, then nodded uncertainly. Yes, officer, I think I understand. With those words, he began to make his way down the walkway to where his car was parked. His gait was like that of a man stunned by a blow to the head, barely conscious of his surroundings and barely aware of what was going on. Under the supervision of several neighbors, he drove the car out of the driveway and then slowly drove back the way he had come. What do I do now? He asked, still in a daze. You're safe now, Mrs. Hardaway, the policeman shouted through the door. He's gone. Thank you, officer, came the reply. I'll just stay in the house for a while. The policeman nodded at the door, turned and left, just as the performer did. Marlene. Marlene Hardaway stood at the front door and took a deep breath, but not of relief, but of elation. I did it, she thought jubilantly. He never realized what had struck him. At the same moment, she began to have fun with the man. Wes. The next morning, Wes woke up early in the morning confused, unable to remember where he was. He had only slept for a few hours, 
and it took him a while to realize that he was lying on an unfamiliar bed in some nameless motel. The whole thing felt like a dream, or rather a nightmare. All afternoon and evening he pondered what had happened when he got home, trying to make sense of what had happened. When that failed, he started going over everything he could remember about the past days and weeks. It was maddening. He couldn't remember anything that could have caused his wife to react this way. Immersed in idle ruminations, he set them aside to ponder his current situation. The good news was that since he was traveling, he had his shaving kit with him. The bad news was that all the clothes he had brought with him were dirty or wrinkled. And I can't go home to get new ones because I'm locked out. And then an even more depressing thought struck him. With this damned restraining order, I'll probably have to hire a lawyer to even buy a clean suit. He glanced at the cheap clock on the nightstand and saw that it was too early to try to call the law firm. His empty stomach reminded him that he hadn't had dinner the night before. Food would have to be his first priority, he decided. He found a fast food joint on the highway that was opening early and hungrily pounced on a junk food breakfast while writing down all the tasks he had to complete. The first of these was one he was particularly dreading, calling his boss to let her know he probably wouldn't be in today. Edith Norton was the kind of micromanager who believed her role was to oversee everything her employees did. Even after sending him to San Diego, she resented the fact that Wes was absent. He knew she wouldn't appreciate his absence the first day he was due back. He returned to the motel and called Edith's number ahead of time, hoping to dispense with the voicemail. But sure enough, she answered on the second ring, and her reaction was exactly what Wes had feared. He'd planned to blame his absence on a cold, but she'd refused to accept that explanation. So, unable to come up with an alternative excuse, he'd been forced to admit the truth. She was not satisfied with the headlines and continued to question him until he was forced to detail the whole horrific event. Her response was less than sympathetic. She kept saying, You must have done something that made your wife act like that. The only way he could convince his boss to let him stay was to warn her that without a change of clothes, I'd probably stink up the whole apartment. She snickered and reprimanded, but finally agreed, warning him, You'd better be at work tomorrow in clean clothes. He cursed under his breath and quickly hung up. Having finished with this unpleasant business, he set about finding a lawyer. There was no shortage of law firms in California's state capital, but most of the larger firms didn't even list family law in their practice. Helplessly scrolling through online listings, he decided to look for best family law attorney in Sacramento. But when he called the recommended firm, he soon discovered that Marlene had already contacted them. Wes tried several more recommended firms to no avail, None of them could even meet with him for several weeks. Finally, desperate, he set out to find a small firm, hoping its attorneys wouldn't be too busy. The first place he called was Winston Samuels and Associates, and he was pleased when the receptionist informed him that Mr. Samuels had some free time that afternoon. He made an appointment, but after hanging up the phone, he began to wonder why the lawyer wasn't busier. Nevertheless, he decided to act. I need to find some help right away, he said to himself. After doing the first two things he did, he sat down in an uncomfortable motel chair and thought about it, looking at his wrinkled pants. He didn't feel like trying out the motel laundry room. It'll probably be easiest to buy a change of clothes for tomorrow, he decided. This prompted him to check his bank account. He was relieved to see that his last paycheck had been deposited into the account while he was out of town. Then he remembered his meeting with Winston Samuels. I wonder how much it will cost. He quickly checked the money market account that he and Marlene had jointly maintained and was horrified to see that there was one dollar left in it. Heck, I can understand her taking half, but to clean out the whole account is just wrong, he raged. He finally cooled down enough to add that to the list of things to discuss with the new lawyer. The next task was to drive to the Target store in Arden and do some shopping. He managed to find pants and a shirt suitable for the office, then he added socks and underwear. After putting the purchases in a large red Target bag, he impulsively decided to drive to his house. Driving slowly down the block, he tried to peer into the windows to see any signs of life. Seeing none, he drove sadly back to the motel, stopping only to grab more fast food. After a lonely lunch in his hotel room, Wes drove downtown to the address of the law firm he had called. The firm was located in an old office building a few blocks from the Capitol Mall. After studying the directory in the lobby, he took the elevator to the sixth floor and walked to a glass door with an old-fashioned gilded sign that read, Winston Samuels and Associates. When he entered and introduced himself, the receptionist invited him to sit down and then disappeared through the door. A few minutes later, she reappeared and asked him to follow her. The woman led West to a corner office and opened a door labeled Winston Samuels, attorney at law. The man who shook his hand looked to be well into his 60s, 
with short gray hair slicked back and wire-rimmed glasses hanging over his ears. Well, Wes thought, at least he looks experienced. Encouraged by the lawyer, Wes quickly recounted what had happened at his house and then handed him the papers the process server had handed him. Samuels took his time going through them, then looked at Wes carefully. Very good, young man. What would you like me to do for you? Wes threw him a pleading look. Perhaps you can somehow get this restraining order lifted? If I could meet with Marlene, I'd try to talk her out of it. She's lost her way, and I don't even know what's wrong. Samuels interlocked his fingers, then turned to look out the window. After a few seconds, he turned back to his new client and leaned forward again. If I may, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you. Wes nodded, and the man began to list his considerations on his fingers. First, in California, you cannot prevent a divorce if the other partner wants one. To put it bluntly, your wishes don't matter. Second, by locking you out of the house, your wife has made it clear that she does not want to discuss her decision with you. Third, she reinforced her wishes by obtaining a restraining order that effectively precludes her from seeing you at all, except in the presence of her attorney. Fourth, by seizing your joint bank account, she is trying to pressure you into agreeing to the divorce as quickly as possible. We will eventually recover your half of the funds, but she is hoping you will feel the financial pressure sooner, especially with your additional living expenses. Don't forget, you are still responsible for the mortgage, utilities, and other expenses necessary to maintain the home, even if you don't live in it. Finally, you need to know that your wife is not off the hook, as you put it. She's been planning this for a long time. How do you know that? muttered Wes. Samuels looked at him calmly. Getting a restraining order isn't something you can do in a day or two. She had to hire an attorney a while back. It would take time for her attorney to prepare the motion and present it to the judge for review and approval. Likewise, it took time to hire a bailiff and change the locks on the house. Obviously, she had it all meticulously planned out in advance. Wes sank into a chair. She never once hinted to me that anything was wrong. He shook his head in bewilderment. She even confessed her love to me when I called from the airport. The older man didn't respond in any way. Wes sighed. Well, I guess I'll get a divorce then. He shook his head angrily. But I'd still like to know why. Why did she decide to end our marriage without even discussing it with me? Samuels shook his head. I can't say anything about that, but I may be able to refer you to someone who can. There is a detective agency whose services our firm engages on a regular basis. They are efficient, effective, and reasonably priced. In addition, they are convenient. After all, they are on the same floor of this building as we are. I'd be happy to contact them on your behalf if you wish. You're damn right I will. I want to find out what's going on. The lawyer picked up the phone and asked the receptionist to contact him. A few minutes later, she knocked on the door and peeked inside. Trevor can see Mr. Hardaway as soon as you two are done. Half an hour later, Wes was standing outside the Sacramento Confidential Investigations Office. He noticed that the door bore the same gilded lettering as the attorney's office. Reluctantly, he knocked on the door. Almost immediately, a trim, middle-aged man in a tracksuit and slacks opened it. Come in, Mr. Hardaway, the man greeted him. I've been expecting you. I'm Trevor Samuels, head of the SCI division. Nice to meet you, Wes replied politely and shook the man's hand. Then he paused. Did you say Trevor Samuels? That's the same name as... The detective grinned. Yeah, I'm Winston's brother. We both went to law school, but Wynn got his law degree and I got my detective's badge. After I left the police force, he and I developed a mutually beneficial partnership. Noticing the hesitation on Wes's face, he hurried to continue. But don't let that put you off. I spent 25 years as a detective in San Francisco before going out on my own, so I know what I'm doing. Now get back to my office and let's talk. The detective listened in silence as Wes told his story. Your brother says I can't stop this divorce, he concluded, but I'd like to know what's really going on. It's bad enough having your whole life turned upside down. And getting ambushed like this is just salt on the wound. It's so humiliating that she locked me in the house and gave me a protection order. I want to know why she did all that. The detective nodded prudently. I can certainly understand that, and I'm sure we can give you answers as to why she did what she did. But I don't need to investigate anything to guess why she took that protective order. Assuming you're honest with me and you never hit or hurt her? No, definitely not. I would never do that, Wes muttered. In that case, I'm sure your wife is laying the groundwork for her future at your expense. Wes threw him a confused look. When her friends ask her about the divorce, the detective explained, all she has to say is, I don't really want to talk about it, but I had to issue a protective order on Wes. From now on, you're the bad guy. Everyone will think they know why she locked you up and filed for divorce. Your reputation will go down the toilet, and she, the Holy of Holies, 
will never say a word against you. Wes's mouth dropped open. I can't believe she could be that evil. Trevor nodded. She set things up very cleverly, Mr. Hardaway. Now the only question is why? I think I'll be able to answer that question pretty quickly, probably as soon as a week from now. That would be great, Wes replied, shaking his hand. For the rest of the day, Wes did everything the lawyer recommended to protect his financial affairs. But the information he had learned earlier continued to gnaw at him. The next morning, Wes went to work at the usual time, but he was greeted in the lobby by Edith Norton. I see you've decided to grace us with your presence this morning, Mr. Hardaway. Between slacking off at the San Diego conference and wasting time on your sordid personal life, you have a lot of work piled up on your desk. I hope you'll be more diligent in reducing it. God, how I hate that woman, he thought, but only nodded and hurried to his cubicle. By skipping lunch and working hard, Wes had actually managed to do a decent amount of damage to the backlog of work. But all his concentration evaporated in an instant when Trevor Samuels called late that night. We've caught a lucky break, Wes. Our researcher managed to find some information that I think you'll find very interesting. Can you come back tomorrow and familiarize yourself with it? Can't you tell me now? I don't mean to be cryptic, Wes, but our policy is that we always present our findings in person. Okay, Wes reluctantly agreed. I'll try to carve out some more free time. If you don't hear from me, I'll come by first thing in the morning. Miss Norton proved to be as unfriendly as he feared. Mr. Hardaway, I don't care what goes on in your home life. You can't just take off work whenever you want. I've been generous with you so far, but if you insist on taking tomorrow off, it must count against your vacation. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am, he replied sullenly, not the least bit concerned about losing a vacation day. What do I care about? The vacation I had planned to spend with Marlene isn't going to happen anyway. When Wes walked into the office the next morning, Trevor Samuels was in high spirits. We're in luck, he told his client. Come on in and I'll show you what I'm talking about. He led Wes over to his desk and turned the computer screen around so Wes could see it. The detective clicked on a file and a strange, distorted image of Wes's house from across the street appeared on the screen. Don't worry about the picture, Trevor reassured him. It's the fisheye lens that makes the image look weird. But you'll still be able to see all the details you need. A moment later, a silver BMW i8 appeared to the left of the screen. The car made a quick turn into Wes's driveway. The garage door opened and the car pulled inside. A moment later, the garage door closed, and 30 seconds later, the image went dark. Wes looked at the detective with a puzzled expression on his face. What was I looking at? Trevor clicked the mouse, and the scene reappeared. Then he stopped it. Look at the date and time, he said, pointing at the screen. That was yesterday, 25 to 12, Wes said, still unsure. That's not your wife's car, is it? asked Trevor. No, she drives a Honda. And then it hit him. Oh, looks like she had a guest. Exactly, who has a remote with a new code for your garage. He clicked the mouse again, and Wes saw the garage door open, and then a silver car pull out and drive away. The time was 1.32 p.m. that afternoon. Acid began to build up in Wes's stomach. Well, I guess it didn't take her long to find a new friend. Trevor wasn't done. He fiddled with the mouse and selected another file. When it started playing, Wes wondered if he was looking at the previous video. The same sports car appeared in the same direction and pulled into Hardaway's garage again. When Wes looked at Winston, the detective pointed to the time date stamp. Wes took two breaths. That was three weeks ago, he exclaimed. Trevor nodded solemnly. I'm afraid it was. How often? asked Wes almost fearfully. We have documents from the last six months, Wes. We haven't had time to go through them all, but it looks like your wife had lunch with the same visitor two or three times a week during that period. Now the acid in my stomach churned. How could I have been so blind? He turned to look at the detective. Where did you get all this from? He demanded. Trevor leaned back in his chair. There's a neighborhood watch organization in your neighborhood. Some neighbors, like the couple across the street from you, have these fancy doorbells with motion-activated cameras. Everything they see goes into a cloud database. Mostly it's harmless stuff. Deliveries, people walking by, and the like. But every once in a while, one of them catches a porch pirate or a cheating housewife. Wes gritted his teeth. Too bad we never got to see the bastard. Trevor didn't say anything back. Instead, he clicked the mouse again, bringing up another file. This time, as the sports car pulled into Wes's driveway, the door opened with a delay. Trevor clicked the mouse and the image froze. Then he clicked another key and the image on the screen zoomed in. The detective pointed a finger. There's the license plate. I don't recognize it. I have a contact at the DMV, Trevor said and pressed the button again. 
a California driver's license appeared on the screen with a picture of a handsome man staring blankly into the camera. Does the name John McKenzie mean anything to you? He asked. Son of a bitch, muttered Wes. Marlene works hard for his ad agency. I bet that's how they met her. He jumped to his feet. I'm going to go and argue with him right now. Wait, wait, Trevor shouted, reaching out and grabbing Wes's wrist with a surprisingly strong grip. This is exactly why I insist on presenting the information in person. Sit down and let's talk this over before you do something stupid. Wes glared angrily at the man, then took a deep breath and reluctantly sat back down. That's better, the detective said soothingly. Now listen to me, Wes. For all I know, you're an ex-Marine who can kick Mackenzie's ass hard. Or maybe he's a seasoned killer and put you in the hospital. But either way, you'll prove that your wife was right to ask for a restraining order. Your reputation is already shaky. Don't ruin it permanently. Wes stared at him intently, then slowly bowed his head in submission. I'm not a fighter. If I went to Mackenzie's office, I'd probably come out of it worse. He rolled his eyes. Besides, Marlene would probably love the idea of two men fighting over her. He looked at Samuels again. But I have to do something. If I don't, I'm letting Marlene win. Besides, you say my reputation is already in jeopardy. I can't let the two of them get away with this. Look, Wes, I understand your feelings, but there are other ways to get what you want without putting you in jail. Yeah? Like what? I discussed your case with Dash Daniels, my IT expert. She knows all about social media and new media. She has some ideas. I think you should listen to her and see what you think. Wes looked at him skeptically. I don't know. Come on, she's right down the hall. Just give her a chance to tell you what's on her mind. That way, if you don't like it, you won't lose anything. Trevor led a reluctant Wes down the hallway to a door draped with a square of wood that read, Anti-Social Network. Ignore it, the detective said hastily. It's just her weird sense of humor. He cast a glance at his client. I know she's a bit unusual, but don't let that put you off. With those words, he knocked on the door and stepped inside, with Wes following at his heels. Wes's first impression was that he had entered a college dormitory. In the center of the room was a battered wooden desk with several flat screen monitors, one of which was the largest Wes had ever seen. Against one wall stood a mattress piled with books and magazines. The dark gray walls were hung with posters of famous personalities, most of whom Wes didn't recognize. But the most unusual thing about the room was its occupant, a tall, slender girl of indeterminate age, dressed in tight black high-waisted jeans and a black sleeveless t-shirt that left her midsection exposed. Exotic tattoos adorned the sleeve on her left arm. She wore dark, gothic makeup that contrasted with her hair, which was dyed pure white and styled with gel to make it stand up in a loose curl, except for her right ear where it was cut short. To Wes, she looked like a Japanese anime character. While he tried diligently not to look at her, she held out her hand for a handshake. I'm Dash Daniels, she said in a soft voice that didn't seem to match her appearance. You must be the chitty. Wes instinctively returned the handshake when her words reached him. What? he asked. If your soon-to-be ex-wife is cheating, then you're cheating, she explained casually. Now, Dash, Trevor interjected, behave yourself. He headed for the door, but before he left, he looked at Wes with almost pleading eyes. Just hear her out, okay? Then he was gone. Wes turned around apprehensively, but Dash invited him over to the futon. Okay, have a seat and tell me all about it. She then sat down on the other end of the futon, crossing her legs, and Wes noticed that she was barefoot. As soon as he sat down, she began to tell him. I don't normally do this kind of work, but I'm partial to crooks, so I'm willing to help you. I already know the basic facts from my father, but... Wait a minute, Trevor is your father? Yes, she grinned wryly, and Winston is my uncle. I guess you didn't know it was a family business. Anyway, I hear your ex has put you between a hammer and an anvil. If we're going to shift this on to her, I need to know all the details about what she did, what you did, and how you feel about it. Heart and soul, you know what I mean? Not really, Wes admitted. And you'll have to forgive me, but I don't know what you do and how a computer jock can help me. No offense. She grinned. No offense taken. As you've heard, I do a lot of research online for my dad and uncle. But what I really enjoy is social media, reputation management, and influencing attitudes. It's what you need if you want to counter what your ex is trying to do. But, he objected uncertainly. Look, she said patiently, do you use the internet a lot? Do you have a Facebook page, a Twitter account, post videos on TikTok, watch channels on YouTube, sell things on eBay, follow your friends on Instagram, any of that? No, not really. I mean, not once. Despite the dark lipstick, she was smiling charmingly, he decided. 
Okay, then let's go over social media for dummies, shall we? The fact is that a huge and rapidly growing segment of the population is online almost all the time. That's where they get their news. That's where they meet people. That's where they find entertainment. It's all invisible to people like you. But to those who do, the reach and impact is enormous. She saw the doubt in his facial expression. Do you think I'm exaggerating? There are people on YouTube who make six grand a year playing video games. There are thousands of small companies that don't have stores or factories, but make a lot of money selling goods through Amazon. There are giant companies whose most influential spokespeople are not movie stars, but internet personalities. It goes on and on. There are concepts, images, music, and phrases that permeate society. And unless old media picks them up, you'll never know about them. Conversely, there are celebrities and public figures who are praised or reviled solely on the internet. And their success or failure depends on how the Twitterverse reacts to them, if we're talking about just one medium. But what does all this have to do with me? To tell you the truth, I don't know yet. But my job is to find a way to get the attention of this invisible audience and sway them to your side. If I succeed, your ex will be helpless. Can you really do that? We'll see. But if you're willing to try, now I need you to tell me your story again. But this time focusing on how you felt, what you were thinking, how you reacted. Those are the levers that move people. Emotions, not facts. Wes hesitated for a moment, then shrugged. What have I got to lose? For the next hour, he told his story from a different, sometimes painful perspective. Start from the moment your plane landed, Dash asked. Tell me what you were thinking, what you were saying when you called her. As he recalled the events, he relived the full range of emotions he had felt and continued to feel. It was excruciating, but at the same time he found the strength to spill it all out. Throughout his story, the young woman took copious notes and asked clarifying questions. When he got to the present, she went back and reviewed what he had written. Then she looked at him, and all humor disappeared from her expression. I think I know how we should play this out. But first I have to ask you something, Wes. How strong are you? He shook his head in confusion. You mean, how much weight can I lift? No, she replied, still not smiling. I mean, how strong is your ego? How well you can take criticism? How important other people's opinions of you are, in that sense, the strength of personality. Well, I guess I'm as strong a person as anyone else. She looked at him grimly. Well, I guess you'll find that out. I don't understand. She leaned back on the back of the futon. Every good story has what they call an arc. She drew a half circle in the air with her finger to illustrate. The main character starts here. Then something unforeseen happens, and the character arc starts to fall until it reaches a peak, a low point. Only then does the situation start to improve. The audience wants to cheer for the protagonist's success, but the only way to get their support is to show the character's suffering. We need to visualize your storyline, Wes. I still don't really know what you're talking about, but if it requires a little suffering, I'm already there. A sad smile creased the corner of her mouth for a moment. We'll see. Then she sat up, adopting the business-like look that only a goth nerd could. Okay, here's what's going to happen next. You need to be ready to go on a tour with me at short notice. I'll call you when the time comes. Can you do that? Well, if it's during business hours, I'll get hell from my boss, but I'm already on her bad guy list, so I guess a little more won't matter. Great, she exclaimed and jumped to her feet. I'm going to love this, she grinned, shaking his hand. I hate cheaters. Wes walked out of the building, trying to remember everything that had happened since he'd walked in. What did I deserve all this? He groaned. And what have I gotten myself into now? A day later, Wes was eating lunch at his desk when the phone rang. It was Dash. Can you pick me up? She asked. We have a chance now, and I don't know when the next one will come along. My boss is going to hate me, he told her grimly. But that's nothing new. I can swing by your office in 20 minutes. Miss Norton was indeed annoyed by Wes's request. But since he had a lot of work piling up, she reluctantly agreed. But remember, all that personal time is deducted from your vacation. She shouted at his back as he walked toward the door. When he reached the building he'd mentally come to refer to as the Samuels Building, Dash was waiting for him on the sidewalk, dressed in leggings, a white top, and flip-flops. You have a new closet, he joked, but she ignored him. We're heading to your house, she ordered, and he threw her a sharp look. You know I can't be there, especially with Marlene home. Don't worry about that, she reassured him. My father saw her leave just before I called you. He'll keep an eye on us while we're there. Okay, so what are we going to do, break into the house? Nothing that dramatic. You have to replicate the crime as best you can. The crime? What happened when you got home from the airport? Okay. And what will you do? He inquired. Oh, I'm going to film the whole thing, 
she nonchalantly informed him. What, why? It's simple, Wes. We need to give your fans a backstory before we sell your storyline. He shook his head in confusion. Fans? I don't have fans. She grinned. Not yet, no. But don't worry about that now. Right now, I want you to tell me again how you felt at every turn during this whole encounter. Tell me, what emotions did you feel? Well, when I pulled up to our house, I was probably excited to see Marlene. Then when I couldn't get in the door, I was upset and a little angry. And when she said she had locked me out, I was stunned. I guess moving so quickly to confusion and depression threw me into a state of shock. I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I was so stunned I couldn't even figure out what to do. Everything else, the bailiff, the restraining order, the police, it all just added to the confusion and despair I was feeling. Wonderful, she exclaimed. Now when we get to your home, I want you to tell us step by step what happened. We must see all the emotions you have just described to me. Do you think you can do that? I don't know, he said doubtfully. I'm not a very good actor. I don't want you to act, she told him. I want you to repeat what you did and remember your feelings, that's all. Don't worry, I'll walk you through it. Now give me your cell phone. She did something with it, then reached into her pocket and pulled out an unfamiliar gadget. Take this Bluetooth earpiece. I can use it to talk to you while you replay what happened. They reached his neighborhood, which seemed deserted. When he pulled into his driveway, Dash helped him remove the earpiece and carefully hid it out of sight. Then she called him on her cell phone. Speaking softly, she motioned for him to get out of the car and walk to the front door. When he looked back, he saw Dash on the sidewalk with a second phone in her hand filming him. Don't look at me, she said. Go try to walk into your house like you did before. Wes turned away and walked out onto the porch. As he tried in vain to open the house with the key, he felt himself remembering that day, and his mood soured. Ring the doorbell, Wes, he heard, and pressed the button, remembering how frustrated and confused he felt. Now knock on the door he heard, and knocked hard on the door with his knuckles, feeling the growing irritation of not being able to get into his own house. Marlene's yelling at you through the door. She says she changed the locks. And then she drops a bombshell. She wants a divorce. Wes staggered back, remembering how stunned he'd been. He remembered not only what she had said, but the venom in her voice. He tried to contradict her, but she didn't hold out. There's a bailiff following you, a voice in his ear prompted. And as he turned, Wes saw Trevor Samuels, wearing a low-crowned cap, walking toward him with a sheaf of papers in his hands. He handed Wes one copy and then began to read from it. The typed text made no sense, but Wes stared at it as if it contained his death sentence. He turned toward the front door. He heard it. Pound! And started pounding on the door with the heel of his palm. The policeman is telling you to leave, Wes. He turned around, but no one was there. In his mind, however, the words of the menacing policeman sounded like a judge's ruling. Without any prompting, he dropped his hands to his sides, lowered his head meekly, let out a defeated sigh, and began to make his way back down the walkway in front of the house. His legs were so heavy he struggled to get to his feet. His happy little world had just been shattered, and he saw nothing but pain and sadness in front of him. Go to the car, Dash's voice reminded him, and he slowly made his way to the car door without looking up. He climbed in and lowered himself into the seat. You were great, Wes. I got some really good shots, Dash enthused, getting into the passenger seat. He started the engine and began to drive out of his neighborhood and back downtown. But there wasn't a cop there, he began. We don't need him, she waved him away. He wasn't in the picture. Besides, no one but you and Marlene knows about him. She reached out and squeezed his shoulder. That was amazing, Wes. You really got into it. Can we not talk right now? The pain in his voice was obvious, and she jerked her hand away sharply. She stared out the window the rest of the way, but once or twice she cast an oblique glance at him. By the time they got back to Samuel's building, she'd already made her decision. Park in the parking lot, she told him, and when he threw her a questioning look, she said, You're coming with me. She led him into her office and gestured for him to sit on the futon. She then disappeared through the door and reappeared a minute later with two bottles of beer. She sat down next to him and they drank in silence. When they finished, she took two more bottles. Only after they had drunk almost all of the second bottle did she try to talk to him. You're really into this, aren't you? She asked. He stared off into the distance, then sighed. Yeah, I guess I did. It all came back to me from there. The shock, the confusion, the despair. I guess I never dealt with it all. She nodded. I'm sorry to put you through all that, Wes, but honestly, your reaction will have a real impact on the audience. He took another sip and looked at her. I still don't see how any of this is going to help. 
I'm going to use this video to start the downhill slide of your storyline. Then I'm going to send you even lower. Only then can we bring it all back to a happy ending. His face took on a bitter expression. So what you're promising me is blood, sweat, and tears, huh? Exactly, she glowered. But remember, it's all over for the British in the end. Yes, but only because they had America on their side. She nodded and smiled even wider. Yeah, and you have me on your side. It wouldn't even be a fair fight. Then she stood up. But that can only happen if you get out of here now and let me do some work. Okay, Dash, I don't know why, but I have faith in you. He stood up as well. Anyway, thanks for the beer. She stepped closer and, to his surprise, gave him a quick hug. Hang in there, Wes. I know it's hard right now, but things will get better, I promise. As he drove back to the motel, he found himself actually feeling a little more hopeful. His good mood didn't last until the next morning. Edith Norton was nowhere to be seen, and the daily grind was quickly wearing him out. The only bright spot was a call from Dash in the middle of the afternoon. Can you come over after work? I've got something you'll want to see. The remaining two hours of work went by pretty quickly. When he entered Dash's office, she sat him down in one of the chairs behind her desk and then unfolded a large monitor in front of him. To understand what I'm doing, you'll have to watch a little YouTube first, she explained. Ever heard of Gossip Girl Gertie's Back Fence? No. Should I have? You definitely should have. Gertie has one of the most popular channels on YouTube right now. Let me show you. An advertisement for beauty products appeared on the screen, and Dash waited impatiently for a chance to skip ahead. When she did, the screen immediately showed an image of a middle-class backyard surrounded by a white picket fence. The banal music of a large orchestra sounded. A sign in the sky read, Gossip Gertie's Back Fence. Suddenly, the scene switched to a set with a desk with the same white fence in front of it. Behind it sat an improbably dressed hostess in an obvious 1950s-style blonde wig. Her clothes were of the same era. Oh, how nice to see you, shrilled the woman. I'm Gertie the Gossip Girl, and I just found out the juiciest gossip ever. Now I'm going to tell you all about it. With those words, she began listing gossip, people's life stories, fashion and beauty tips, product recommendations, and more. Behind her, the screen filled with charts and videos illustrating each segment. After a few minutes, Dash paused the program. Okay, I think you get the idea. What do you think? Is this her hobby? A hobby? Dash snorted derisively. It's her full-time job. Can she do it for a living? Advertisers pay very well for appearances on successful YouTube shows. How well? Let me put it this way. The host of a show that has a million subscribers can make a little over $50,000 a year. He whistled. $50,000? Not bad. She grinned. Gossip Girl Gertie's back fence averaged about 100 million subscribers last year. 100 million? Wait, that means she gets $5 million a year. He stopped, stunned by the amount. Dash walked around the table and sat in another chair in front of the flat screen. Here's the thing. To be successful, a show like this requires a constant influx of content. Obviously, most of it comes from publicists, advertisers, and promoters, but Gertie needs more if she wants to keep all her subscribers. That's where people like me come to the rescue. Every once in a while, I'll suggest a story she thinks she can use. If she likes it, her program will carry a lot of weight in terms of influencing her audience. That's exactly what I'm going to do with your story. Push it to her so we can get your attention. So why would she be interested in my story? It's simple, she said. I'm going to make you the symbol of every heartless man who has ever cruelly abandoned a wife or girlfriend. What? I'm a quitter, not a dumpster diver. Not in my version. Here's the footage I put together, as well as my proposed script for Gertie. Take a look. With those words, she clicked on the file and a black and white video of Neighborhood Watch appeared on the screen, just as Dash's father had shown Wes. Only this time it was Wes's car pulling up in his driveway. Dash started reading. How many of you girls have been dumped by a boyfriend or kicked out of your marriage by an insensitive husband? How many of you have wished the shoe was on the other foot? On the screen, Wes saw him pounding on the door to no avail. In Sacramento, California, the wife in the house was clearly fed up with her hubby, so she changed all the locks and kicked him out of the house. The scene changed to a view from the sidewalk, obviously shot with a handheld camera. The footage began with a long shot and then zoomed in on a distraught Wes. Look at the look on his face. He can't believe his wife is capable of this. Now watch this guy deflate when the bailiff hands him the divorce papers, Dash read. On the screen, Wes's face lowered in obvious horror. And now for the grand finale, Dash read. The humiliated hubby must take the long, shameful walk to his car and out of her life. It's so nice to see a guy have to suffer for once. 
The screen was almost painful to watch as Wes hurried down the driveway. Dash looked up from the script to gauge Wes's reaction. She'd assumed he wouldn't be happy, but the look on his face stunned her. That was the most humiliating thing I've ever seen, he exclaimed. Do we really have to do it like that? She patted his arm. I'm sorry, Wes, but it's the only way. He shook his head doubtfully. Okay, since you say so. At least you didn't give any names. I hope no one recognizes me. The young woman turned away and said nothing. The next day at work, Wes's phone beeped late at night with a message from Dash. It read, You are live on Gertie. Fasten your seatbelt, the flight is about to get choppy. For the last hour of the day, Wes had kept one eye on his work and the other on the rest of the office staff, but he hadn't noticed any indication that anything was wrong. Edith Norton did, however, cast a glance at him as he left at half past 5 p.m., but that wasn't unusual. Relieved, he decided to stop by Dash's office to see how things were going. He caught her in her seat, she always seemed to be there, and inquired about the latest news. Gertie really liked the job, Dash informed him cheerfully. She used it just like you saw yesterday, only she did the voicing instead of me. More importantly, she told me she's already gotten a great response. She winked at him. I think a lot of women really enjoy seeing an insensitive man suffer. But I'm not like that, he protested. Yes, but they don't know that. Anyway, it hasn't been that long and you've already started spreading all over the internet. Someone on TikTok took a screenshot of your face and sent it to their network, and now it's spreading like crazy. I'm also getting posts about it on my Facebook accounts, which means it's really starting to gain momentum. She saw the look of concern on his face. But don't worry, on the internet you're called HH, humiliated husband. Just the kind of nickname I was counting on, he muttered sarcastically. Okay, so what's next? We're going to sit around for another day to let this develop. And then we're going to move on to phase two. What's phase two? Oh, she said nonchalantly. That's where we're going to turn you into a real bastard. He shuddered. Does it have to be? Absolutely. Wes, you can't get up unless you fall down first. I don't think Newton said that. Yes, but Sir Isaac didn't know about the internet. He spent the rest of the evening in a somber mood, and it took him a while to fall asleep in the cramped motel room. As a result, he overslept and had to rush to work in time for the start of the workday. As he entered the lobby, he noticed the receptionist staring at him intently. As he headed down the hallway to his cubicle, he noticed her quickly pick up the phone to make a call. What was that? he asked, settling down at his desk. The strangeness was only getting worse with each passing day. It seemed to him that an unusual number of employees passed by his cubicle, and every now and then he heard snide comments and muffled laughter. Finally, just before lunch, a supervisor burst into the office. I don't know what you're letting yourself in for, Wes Hardaway, but this is starting to detract from the work. Edith, all I'm doing is working on the Wilson case. I'm talking about all this nonsense you've been up to on the internet. It's not very professional to put your personal problems out there for everyone to see. Ma'am, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, but I will have that file ready for your review no later than 2 p.m. Very well, but email it to me rather than bringing it to me. Judging by the way you lug around town, it will take me an hour to get it. With that last barb, she turned and walked away, leaving Wes anxious. If that Neanderthal computer saw me, this damn story must be everywhere. He groaned. For the rest of the day, he kept his nose out of his work, trying to be as inconspicuous as possible. It didn't help. One day, when he needed to go to the restroom, he saw a group of co-workers standing in the hallway. From the crowd of people, a summer intern, who had been shoved by someone in the group, nervously approached Wes. Mr. Hardaway, some people want me to ask you if your initials are HH. As Wes stared at him in shock, the entire group erupted into laughter, and all Wes had to do was hastily remove himself to the relative safety of the restroom. When it was five o'clock in the evening, Wes hopped out of the office and sprinted past the other employees to his car. Then he drove straight to the Samuels building and hurried over to Dash. What did you do to me? He demanded when she let him in. I've been going to hell all day. All the employees know it's me, even my boss. I'm not surprised, she replied easily. Wes, you've achieved a very rare result. You've become a meme. A what? A meme is an image on the internet that people associate with some idea or emotion. That clip of you walking away humiliated has already been picked up and used thousands of times. Wes, you're the poster boy for a man humiliated by a woman. He sank down in his chair, wrapping his arms around his head. Dash walked over and knelt in front of him. Wes, I have to warn you, it's going to get worse, much worse. Tomorrow, Gertie will find out that you've been served with a protection order. You know what people will think then? When he groaned loudly, she took his face in her hands and looked into his eyes. 
I know this is going to be very hard for you, but I promise you that the lower you fall now, the higher you'll soar when it's over. Right now you just have to be strong. Can you do that? Oh God, Dash, I'll try. I don't really have any other choice now, do I? Marlene. A little before noon the next day, Jack McKenzie rolled his silver BMW into the driveway of the Hardaway house and parked it in the garage. After making sure the garage door was closed, he entered the house and went in search of his lover. When he found Marlene, she was sitting at her computer, frowning. Did you see that? She asked, pointing to the screen where Gertie Gossip Girl was showing Wes retreating down the path that had become infamous. How the hell did they get that tape? He glanced over his shoulder at her and grinned. Probably one of your roommates was walking around and filmed it on her cell phone. He started rubbing her shoulders. But who cares about that? Truth be told, it makes Wes look like a complete idiot, and you're the smart one for getting rid of him. I guess you're right, she nodded. But I can't help but feel sorry for that poor jerk. Look at the pain on his face. Wes. The next day started out a little better for Wes. He was still being stared at as he walked to work. But the novelty of the situation seemed to have passed. I'll get over it, he decided. But his comparative equanimity was broken mid-morning when he received another text from Dash. The second part of Gertie's is up. You are the main subject. Stay cool. With fear, he logged onto YouTube and found the Gossip Gertie channel. Eagerly awaiting the commercial and intro to the show, he watched in mesmerized horror as the influential YouTube user began to ruin his life. As footage of him pounding on the front door played in the background, Gertie said triumphantly, You've all seen my article about the humiliated hubby before. But now his story has taken a different, darker turn. The scene switched to a process server handing Wes papers. Turns out Wes got more than just divorce papers. The real bombshell is what else hubby got? A restraining order. An official paper appeared on the screen, filling the entire screen. The only legible words at the top read, Restraining Order. And that's not all, Gertie continued. This order requires our humiliated hubby to stay at least 200 yards away from his wife at all times. It doesn't take a fertile imagination to guess what must be going on to require such protection. No word yet on whether any charges have been filed, but we'll keep an eye on this one. All we can say to the wife at this point is we hope you are safe. And to the humiliated hubby, all we can say is goodbye, and we hope you get what you deserve, along with all the other wife beaters. Oh my god. Gertie could put a bounty on my head. I've got to get out of here. Normally, there was a perfectly discernible level of background noise in his office. People talking on their phones, office machines humming, people walking down the hallways. But the sound Wes heard outside his cubicle was more like a low, menacing growl. It stopped him. He looked up and saw several co-workers talking among themselves, shaking their heads and throwing accusatory glances in his direction. He continued to watch them every few minutes, hoping to see a gap through which he could slip out unnoticed. But there was none. On the contrary, the crowd seemed only to increase. He tried to immerse himself in his work, but people kept passing by the entrance to his cabin and muttering insults under their breath, which he was evidently bound to overhear. Suddenly, the noise died down and the crowd parted as Edith Norton entered his cubicle. Mr. Hardaway, I warned you the other day that unprofessional behavior has a negative impact on our office. Normally, your personal life is your business, but not when it extends to beating your wife. But I never even touched Marlene, he exclaimed. Then why did she see fit to seek legal recourse? The woman demanded. Why should you have to be 200 yards away from her all the time or risk arrest? Well, I really don't know why. Enough she shouted, startling him. This company has zero tolerance for spousal abuse, Mr. Hardaway. You would know that if you spent less time surfing the internet and more time reading the employee handbook. However, ignorance of company policy is no excuse. You are hereby terminated. You are no longer an employee of this firm effective today. Wes's mouth dropped open. But she didn't let him finish. You will be paid for the work you have done, and you will receive a separate check for two weeks salary as severance pay. Now I need you to leave the premises immediately. Leave everything but your jacket and go. If you have personal belongings, they will be sent to you in due course. Ralph over here will escort you out. She nodded, and a stout security guard entered the booth. Mr. Hardaway, we won't have any problems, will we? Wes was shocked. He shook his head, then let the guard take his hand and lead him away. Behind him, the murmur of voices grew louder and louder. When he got into his car, he sat behind the wheel in a daze. A sharp tap on the window caused him to look up and see Ralph gesturing to the parking lot exit. Wes started the engine and drove slowly. He had no idea where he was going, but after a while he found himself outside the Samuels building. 
The shock of being fired was replaced by anger, and he rushed to Dash's office. Bursting through the door without knocking, he strode to the astonished woman's desk and shouted, I hope you're pleased. Your little storyline just got me fired. They fired you? Why? Oh, yeah. Hatchet-faced Norton just fired my ass. They're going to send me severance pay in the mail. That's great, she exclaimed and jumped to her feet. Don't go anywhere, Wes. I'll be right back. With those words, she ran out of the office and ran down the hall. Puzzled by her reaction, Wes walked over to the futon and laid down on it. Now that the adrenaline was out of his system, he felt exhausted. He was already half asleep when Dash returned. She came over and sat down next to him. Oh, Wes, I'm so sorry you had to go through this. I knew Phase 2 would be provocative, but I didn't think your firm would act so hastily. She reached out to take his hands in hers. It was the worst, Wes, I promise. Tomorrow we'll let things settle down and then we'll launch Phase 3. Oh God, now what? No, no, it's now that your arc will start to climb. You've reached the bottom. It's going to go up from here. Oh, and that reminds me, my Uncle Winston says whatever you do, don't cash checks from your firm. Okay? You talked to your uncle about that? Yes. And he was adamant. Don't sign anything from your firm without his approval. Wes looked at her blankly. Easy for him to say, but I'm going to run out of money very quickly. Paying for a room in this shabby motel, eating out every meal, buying new clothes, it's all overhead. She frowned. Right, I hadn't thought of that. Then her face brightened. Hey, I know that. You could move here. You want me to live in your office? Sure. That's where I live. There's an office through that door that I converted into a bedroom, and we turned the toilet into a three-piece bathroom. But I can't do that. I mean, where would I... He hesitated. Oh, don't worry about that. You can sleep on the futon until we get your situation sorted out. Seeing his indecision, she squeezed his hands. Look, it's stupid to spend money on a motel. And now that you've been laid off, you'll probably be spending most of your time here anyway. So it'll be a lot more convenient. When he didn't answer, she continued. Tell you what, let's go out and have dinner and talk about it. She invited him to a small bistro, and over wine and dinner he told her all that had happened in his office. She listened to him sympathetically without saying a word. When they were done, she insisted on paying the check. Back in the car, she turned and looked at him brightly. You know what? We're not too far from your motel, are we? Why don't we stop by there? You get your stuff and check out, and I'll drive you back to the office. He still had his doubts, but he was too tired to argue with her, so he let her drive him to the motel. He didn't have much stuff, and it didn't take him long to pay the motel bill and get back downtown. When he got his things into her office, she helped him turn the futon into a bed. When she returned, he was surprised to see her wearing a long t-shirt with video game characters on it. Everything you need? She asked. He nodded and she turned to leave. Dash! He stopped her. Thanks for doing this. I'm glad I'm here and not in this damn motel. She smiled. Me too, Wes. After she turned out the overhead lights, he lay in the semi-darkness coming from the computer screensavers and the little LED lights on the processors. He closed his eyes and a wave of depression came over him. What had happened to my life? I lost my marriage, I lost my house, I lost my job. My friends have abandoned me, and now I'm trying to sleep in someone else's office on someone else's bed. What the hell did I do wrong? He kept trying to answer that question until he finally fell asleep. He woke up the next morning when Dash came through the office door with coffee and sweet rolls. He was still in a melancholy mood, but she soon distracted him by having him search various social media sites for any mention of him and his situation. The search didn't take long. Typing humiliated hubby into a search engine, Wes was amazed at the number of tweets, TikToks, Instagrams, Facebook links, and other references. Someone had even created a Wikipedia entry, and he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. When he noticed how much stuff he'd found, Dash smiled embarrassedly. I have to be honest with you, Wes. I spent most of yesterday posting images, comments, reviews, and links so that other people would be sure to see your story. When he frowned, she hurried to continue but it didn't take long on my part. The interverse picked it up and started spreading your story on its own. I even found comments about you on websites in other countries and in other languages. Great, he muttered sarcastically. So now I'm infamous all over the world. Even more disturbing to Wes was the bitterness and even hatred with which anonymous authors were speaking out against him. Dozens of commenters urged him to do the world a favor and kill himself or said something to that effect. I'm going to have to hire a bodyguard before this is over, he groaned, shaking his head. Dash didn't let him wallow in self-pity. The farther you fall now, the higher you'll bounce when you get back up, she promised. I hope you're right, he said dejectedly. 
because right now I'm dropping like a stone. Marlene. Sitting at her computer in her home in Fair Oaks, Marlene was reading several comments in response to the latest revelations from gossip columnist Gertie. With a puzzled expression on her face, she called her lover. Jack, this West thing has really gotten out of hand. I want to get rid of him, not destroy him. He's never hit me or done any of the things these people on the internet accuse him of. I almost feel like I should say something. No, he said sharply. You have to let it all develop as it is. All this publicity will make your divorce go smoothly, plus you'll probably get a better settlement. And when we publicize our relationship, it ensures that no one will say anything negative. After your horrible experience with Wes, our friends will say you deserve a chance at a little happiness. We couldn't have come up with a better scenario. You really think so? Absolutely, baby. Wes has a huge bullseye painted on his chest, and there's a bunch of people who want to take a shot at him. He'll never recover from getting shot at. Wes. After lunch, Dash got a phone call, and when she realized who it was, she put it on speaker so Wes could hear. Hi, Gertie. It's good to hear from you. Did you take the latest information about the humiliated hubby well? She asked, winking at Wes. Good reception? Girl, that story blew up all over the internet. It's the best shit you've ever sent me. I've gotten 50,000 new subscribers in the last day. Any chance you have anything else on this story? Perfect timing, girlfriend. I'm just about to get some material together. I should be able to send it to you by the end of the day. If you like it, you can use it on tomorrow's show. Really? What have you got this time? You won't believe this, but what if it turns out that humiliated husband isn't such a bad guy? Are you kidding me? Really? With those words, Dash outlined the new material she had prepared. When she was done, Gertie was delighted. Gosh, what a twist. My subscribers are just going to go crazy. Tell you what, let's make this into two episodes, even more use. Send them both to me as soon as possible so I can start promoting. When the call ended, Dash turned to Wes cheerfully. Are you feeling a little better already? It's good that Gertie liked it, but we still need to see how her subscribers react. He bestowed a wry smile on her. Though I have to admit I'm starting to feel a little more hopeful. Dash worked through the evening, putting things together the way she wanted them to be. Wes continued to monitor various social media for late responses, but for the most part he stayed out of Dash's way, letting her go about her business. When she was finally satisfied, she uploaded the package to Gertie. Only after receiving a thumbs up from Gertie in response did Dash relax and turn her attention to Wes. I don't know about you, but I'm starving. How about we order a pizza? I've got some more beer in the fridge so we can relax and unwind. Sounds good. When they were done eating, he stretched and looked at his temporary roommate curiously. How did you and Gertie become such good buddies? We met when we were freshmen at the California Institute of Technology. California Institute of Technology. Yeah. Looking at Gertie on YouTube, you'd never guess that she once wanted to be an electrical engineer at some high-tech company. What about you? Oh, I majored in computer science but never finished. Something else happened and I dropped out and never went back. He realized from the look on her face that she didn't want to go into details, so he tried another question. Where did you get a nickname like Dash's from? Did you do any running or anything like that? She shook her head and grinned. Actually, Dash is short for Dashiell, which is Dashiell Hammett. My father has always loved detective novels, and he's a big fan of The Thin Man and The Maltese Falcon. Wes nodded. Okay, what about Daniels? Where did it come from? The smile faded from her face. Daniels is my asshole ex-husband's last name, she spat out. Oh, wow, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to open an old wound. She shook her head. No, it's fine. She looked away. When I got to college, I was your typical rebellious, emotionally immature girl, ready to break out of scrappy Sacramento. Joey, that was his name, was a real bad boy, and I was stupid enough to get involved with the type. He got me into all sorts of nasty things. Parties, all the usual nonsense that kids that age do. But I was crazy about him. When the school year was almost over, the thought of separation became too much and we ran away. My father was very upset, but he desperately wanted me to get my degree. So he found us an apartment in Pasadena and helped with expenses. I didn't realize that Joey was spending most of that money on bad things. I also didn't know that the rest of the money he was spending on some whore he found. But it all became clear the day Joey walked in on us with that dyed blonde and said he and her were leaving. She looks like she's having dental surgery, Wes thought, looking at Dash's face. It really hit me hard, she continued. I kind of went over to the dark side. There was no money, I had to pay rent, and I was living on the streets for a while. Luckily, my dad found me and brought me home. It took me a long time, but I picked myself up, 
found a job I can support myself with, and here I am. That sounds just awful, Dash. I'm really sorry you had to go through all that, and I'm even more sorry I brought it up. No, it's okay. It was so long ago I've gotten over it. She paused. And if you're wondering why I kept his last name, I did it because I didn't want that creep to be able to erase me. I wanted my last name to be a constant reminder of what he did. She made a dismissive gesture. If it were over again, I'd probably go back to the last name Samuels, but I'm used to it by now, so whatever. It must have been so painful for you. Yeah, but at least I can honestly say I understand what you've been through. Impulsively, he stood up, walked over and hugged her, and after a moment's hesitation, she reciprocated. Well, aren't we a couple? She laughed sadly as they parted. The next day, the two of them were sitting in front of Dash's big flat screen when the new installment of Gertie's gossip was due. Wes was impatient about the slow loading time, but Dash reassured him that it was probably due to network congestion. Those little teasers she posted on Instagram must have generated a lot of interest. Finally, the familiar image of Gertie at her fence table appeared, and it was obvious that the network personality was struggling to contain her enthusiasm. I have good news for you today, gossip lovers. The saga of the humiliated hubby has taken a startling new turn. An image appeared on the screen behind her, taken by the doorbell camera in front of Wes's house. Here's the house you've all seen before, the house of the humiliated hubby. And look, a silver BMW pulls into the driveway and then into the safety of the garage. Gertie paused abruptly. But not before we get the license plate. Who does this car belong to, you ask? A publicity photo of Jack McKenzie, head of the McKenzie agency, appeared on the screen. Isn't that nice? Mr. Jack McKenzie, whose ad agency buys so much art from the wife of a humiliated hubby, has come to comfort the poor woman, to help her through her divorce. But wait. Let's go back and look at the time and date on this surveillance tape. She pointed sharply at the corner of the screen behind her. That's three months before Mrs. Hubby filed for divorce. And guess what? It looks like Mr. McKenzie was comforting the distraught lady several times a week during that entire time. Behind her, the screen showed one image after another of a sports car pulling into the garage. I'm not judging Mrs. Hubby for fooling around behind her husband's back. What I am saying, gossip lovers, is that there seems to be a lot more to this story than we thought. And even better, gossip girl Gertie has even more dirt to share with you next time. So be sure to check out this YouTube channel for our next sensational revelation. With those words, Gertie moved on to the next topic, and Dash turned off the program. Spontaneously, both jumped to their feet and applauded. Wes hugged his partner tightly. That was amazing, he exclaimed. You're amazing. He stared at her for a moment, as if seeing her for the first time, then leaned in for a kiss. After a moment's hesitation, she responded fervently to his kiss. In an instant, the mood went from elation to passion. But no sooner had the temperature risen even higher than there was a knock on the office door, and the couple hastily pulled away just as Winston Samuel's secretary poked her head inside. I hope I'm not interrupting. I was looking for... Ah, there you are, Mr. Hardaway. Mr. Samuels was hoping to have a word with you if you're not busy. No, of course not, Wes replied hastily. I'd be happy to meet with Mr. Samuels. Wes cast one last glance at Dash, then followed the matron down the hall to the lawyer's office. Winston Samuels was already waiting for him and led the young man into his office. Since you have chosen our firm to represent you, I was very interested when my niece informed me of your dismissal. He tilted his head toward Wes. I believe she relayed my recommendation that you not cash checks from your former employer or sign any other materials they might send you. Yes, sir, she passed it on, but I didn't. Good, the attorney continued, because that could mean agreeing to a settlement, and you don't want to accept any offers from them at this time. Okay, Wes said hesitantly. It's my understanding that you were fired from your job because you violated the firm's spousal abuse policy, is that correct? Yes, sir, my former boss explicitly made that clear to me. Is there anyone else who can confirm that? I can probably give you at least half a dozen names of other people who were there and heard what she said. Great. Assuming that's what happened, I've prepared a lawsuit on your behalf against your former firm for wrongful termination. You did not insult your spouse. Wes shook his head vigorously. And they had no reason, other than malicious gossip, to believe otherwise. Furthermore, the way you were publicly fired and escorted off the premises slandered your good name. The firm should be held accountable for that as well. Finally, I have reviewed the online version of your firm's employee handbook and have concluded that your supervisor did not follow company procedure in terminating you. Accordingly, I believe that you have a strong case for legal action. With your permission, 
I would like to file a lawsuit seeking $10 million in aggregate damages from the firm. Does that seem fair to you? West sighed. $10 million? Yes, sir, that sounds very fair to me. Do you think we can get that amount of money? A smile flashed across the older man's lips. I think we have a good chance, but we'd have to go to court to get it, and that would probably take three to five years. Wes's face lowered. But, Samuels continued, the firm won't want the litigation to generate unfavorable publicity. And from what my secretary tells me, your shares in the court of public opinion are rising, which they'll know about too. I think they could be quickly persuaded to enter into an out-of-court settlement for about half that amount, plus my legal fees, of course. Five million dollars will suit me just fine, Wes said quickly. The smile grew wider. I was hoping you'd think so. Accordingly, if you will sign this document, I will begin the process. Wes signed the document and got up to leave, then turned around. Mr. Samuels, will this affect my divorce proceedings? Frankly, I don't want Marlene to benefit from it. I don't think you need to worry, the lawyer said. All of these events occurred well after the divorce petition was filed. Moreover, it was your wife's actions that, at least indirectly, led to your unfair dismissal. Under those circumstances, she should not be entitled to benefits. Wes rejoiced at this news and hurried back down the hall to Dash's office. When he entered, he found her leaning over her keyboard, and when he tried to tell her about it, she interrupted him. Can it wait, Wes? I've got a deadline for another client, and I've got tons of work to do. Without waiting for his response, she turned back to the monitor. He stood for a few moments, disappointed that he couldn't share his good news. But what plagued him the most was the feeling that Dash was avoiding him. Finally, he cleared his throat. I think I'll go for a walk, he told her. Receiving no reply, he turned and left the room. Walking down to the street, the young man headed in the direction of the Capitol Mall. When he reached it, he turned west and walked along the sidewalk until he reached the Tower Bridge, where he stopped and stared at the Sacramento River. It wasn't the view that occupied his thoughts, however. Damn it, I shouldn't have gone at her like that. No wonder she wants nothing to do with me now. Nevertheless, it seemed to me that she responded to me. I don't know, maybe it was just pity. Maybe she was just trying to be nice to her poor horny husband. He was idly watching the workers hoisting cargo aboard the Delta King dinghy. Why did I even kiss her? She's so unlike any girl I've ever been interested in before. And yet there's something about her. But it doesn't matter, she clearly doesn't like me. I'm just a customer, nothing more. When he returned to the Samuels building, she was still immersed in her work, and the distance between them didn't shrink for the rest of the evening. Marlene. While Wes walked the Capitol Mall, Marlene angrily called Jack McKenzie at his office. When he answered, she didn't even say hello. Have you seen that damned gossip show on YouTube? She demanded. How the hell did they get video of you driving into my garage? I thought you said you were careful. I was careful, he replied. One of those damn video callers must have spotted me. How was I supposed to know they keep everything they record for months? I'd like to know who made her go looking for it. I wonder if Wes could have been behind it somehow. Wes? Are you out of your mind? You're talking about the guy everyone calls humiliated husband. Do you really think he could do that to himself? Besides, he didn't know anything anyway. I know, I know, but it must be somebody. Yeah, and I wouldn't mind shooting whoever it was if we could find out. It really put a twist on our plans. I know, and I just hate it. Her tone changed. You know what would make me feel better? Why don't you come over and spend some time with me? He hesitated. I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't want to appear in another video. Maybe we should take it easy for a while until all this settles down. If you arrive after dark, the cameras won't matter, especially if you turn off your headlights before you turn into the driveway. And since Wes is gone, there's no reason not to come at night. I'll make sure you won't regret it, she added in a seductive voice. What time? he asked. As he walked through the garage door, Marlene came out of her bedroom and the sight of her made Jack stop. She was dressed in all black. As he looked at her with a mixture of lust and fear, she clutched the pruning shears in her hand. You kept me waiting, she said accusingly. I'm sorry, he said pleadingly. I couldn't help it. You know what you have to do. Go to the bedroom, she barked. Yes, mistress, he replied, and hurried to do her bidding. Wes. The next day, the relationship between Dash and Wes seemed to be back to normal. In fact, Wes noticed that Dash was becoming more and more animated as the time to watch the latest installment of Gertie's Gossip Girl approached. When the loading usually occurred, she beckoned Wes over to the large flat screen monitor to watch with her. After the customary introduction, Gertie appeared on the screen, her excitement clearly evident. I know that many of you have been gripped by the twists and turns of the humiliated husband saga. 
On the last show, I revealed that his not-so-faithful wife Marlene, her picture appeared on the screen behind Gertie, was having an ongoing affair with advertising executive Jack McKenzie. Could this be the real reason she kicked her helpless hubby out of the house? After all, Marlene had gotten a protective order against her husband. Could it be that it was the cruelty of her humiliated hubby that led her into the arms of another man? Gertie wanted to find out too, so she checked the police records for humiliated hubby. No convictions, no complaints, no calls to the police. How odd. Could it be that Mrs. Hubby just wanted to humiliate her husband further, make him a pariah in society? But if so, why did the Honorable Judge Harold Chalmers issue a restraining order against Hubby? What could have persuaded his honor to take such serious action? Could it be the fact that Judge Chalmers will soon be running for re-election? Behind her, a political ad appeared on the screen with the caption, Re-elect Judge Chalmers in November. And it could also be, Gertie continued, that three weeks before the humiliated hubby was served with the restraining order, the judge received a nice campaign contribution from a prominent local advertising agency? Behind Gertie, the official list of campaign donors appeared on the screen. The entry McKenzie Advertising Agency, $10,000 was circled in red. Gertie tilted her head and winked at the camera. I'm not suggesting that the judge acted because Jack McKenzie, Mrs. Hubby's secret lover, paid him. You can draw your own conclusions about that. What I'm saying is that I think we all owe poor humiliated hubby a fat apology. Wow, just wow, enthused Wes as Dash turned off the video. That should give Marlene and her boyfriend something to worry about. He reached out to hug Dash but held back. Still, his appreciation was evident. Dash, you're a genius. That looked convincing to me. Thanks, she said. But again, the big question is how the interverse will react. She smiled at him. Why don't you go get lunch for us? We'll have plenty of information by the time you get back. When Wes appeared with a bag from the deli, Dash beckoned him over. Come look at this, she encouraged, pointing to her monitor. When he peered over her shoulder, he saw that she was scrolling through an endless list of comments, many of which contained emoticons and gifts. What are those? he asked. That, she replied smugly, is the hash humiliated hubby Twitter feed. Gertie's latest episode sparked a flurry of comments on Twitter. And that's just one segment of the reaction. Gertie's show is getting its own reactions on YouTube, and then more on Instagram and elsewhere. Looks like a lot of people have already watched that last segment. Can you believe it? And now they're taking different sides. She paused to stare at the screen. As far as I can tell, Hubby's team is ahead of Mrs. Hubby's team by about 70% to 30%. Wes froze for a moment, trying to comprehend what was being said. Suddenly, he glanced at the screen. Wait a minute, are you saying that 30% of the audience is on Marlene's side? She waved her hand dismissively. Don't worry about it. You'll always have the crazies. As the saying goes, haters gonna hate. What matters is that you've gone from zero to hero to the vast majority of Twitter users. He looked at her and shook his head appreciatively. Just like you said, that's what happened. I never would have believed it. But I think this storyline of yours is really working. He looked at her admiringly. You know, you're just amazing. Without thinking, he took a step toward the girl, but she pulled away. Listen, Wes, what happened between us the other day? Oh, yeah, that. I just think we need to cool down a little. I know we're kind of living together and all, but I just don't know if I'm ready to... Oh, no, it's okay, Dash. I totally get it. I didn't have to do that. I just got caught up in the moment. She looked at him uncertainly. I mean, I don't mean... No, really, he interrupted. I get it. Before they could say anything else, Wes's cell phone rang. When he looked at it, a strange expression appeared on his face. The call was from a number he had in no way expected to see again. His former boss, Edith Norton. Wes, she said in a voice more pleasant than he'd realized. I'm so glad I caught you. Would you please come into the office and meet with me? I have some important information for you. I don't know, Edith. We didn't part on the best of terms the last time I saw you. I know, Wes, and I'm sorry. But some things have happened here that I think you'll want to know about. It'll be worth your attention, I promise. He started to refuse her, but then remembered the awkwardness between Dash and himself. Okay, he told her. I'll be there soon. When he pulled up to his old office building, he was greeted very differently than last time. The receptionist greeted him warmly, and then shocked him by asking for an autograph. Just as he was signing the autograph puzzled, Edith Norton herself came out to meet him. As she escorted him back to her office, he noticed the heads of the staff peeking out from behind their cubicles like prairie dogs on the Great Plains. Let me get right to the point, Wes, the woman began as soon as he was seated in her office. Last time we met, there were a lot of issues that unfortunately clouded the atmosphere. 
Things were said that, frankly, I wish I could take back. She glanced at him to see how he was taking all of this, but he kept a calm expression on his face. The truth is that your work at the firm has always been good, no, excellent, in fact, and we hate to lose talent. We've all missed you here, so I'd like to offer you your job back. When he didn't respond in any way, she nervously corrected herself. I don't mean your old job, of course. We'd like to offer you a promotion, to director. He was still silent, and she hurried to continue. And not with your previous salary, of course. No, you'll get a 10% raise to match your new title. He continued to stare at her, and she became agitated. Did I say 10%? I meant to say 15%. That would put you in the top quartile of the director's salary range. And did I mention the severance pay you received? We want you to keep it as a sort of signing bonus, like professional athletes do. What do you say, Wes? I've got all the paperwork right here. If you sign this waiver, you'll have a new job waiting for you. After you've taken your three weeks of paid vacation, of course. He sat up straight in his seat. So, Miss Norton, you admit that I was fired for violating the prohibition against spousal abuse, which I did not commit? Do you acknowledge that my termination did not follow the procedures spelled out in the employee handbook? That's all water under the bridge, Wes. There's no need to rehash what, in retrospect, was a silly misunderstanding. Let's focus on the future. Your promotion, your pay raise, and, oh, I forgot to mention, your eligibility to participate in the bonus plan. Just sign these papers and... Wes stood up, interrupting her. Edith Norton, listen carefully. You can take the raise, the pay increase, and the new title and shove it all up your skinny micromanager ass. I'll see you in the firm in court. With those words, he sprinted out of her office, leaving his former boss with a red face and a spray of spit. As he walked down the hallway back to the exit, he thought he heard applause coming from some of the booths. But this time, there were no heads visible. After lunch, Winston Samuels called Wes and asked him to tell him about his visit to his former employer. Tell him you made no commitments, the lawyer said, and please tell him you didn't sign anything. When Wes repeated what Edith Norton had said, the stern old man grinned. It wasn't very prudent to go in there, young man, especially without a lawyer, but I can see why you did. At any rate, I don't think you've done any harm. The fact that your old boss worked so hard to get you back is a very positive sign in my opinion. Anyway, in light of her inept attempt to bribe you, I imagine we'll be hearing something from their lawyers sooner rather than later. When Dash returned, he looked a little more relaxed, and they decided to order dinner on the house. As they sliced Thai food from cardboard boxes, Dash asked him about his visit to his former place of employment, and Wes happily recounted his run-in with his former boss. From there, it seemed natural to tell Dash about the lawsuit. But Wes didn't want to look like he was trying to impress her, so he decided not to mention the amount of the suit or the possibility of a quick settlement. Still, Dash seemed happy for him. After all you've been through, Wes, I hope you get something out of this. I think you deserve a little luck for a change. The conversation broke off, and when he turned around, he saw her staring at him intently. What's the matter, Dash? She hesitated before answering. You asked me about my old life, Wes. Can I ask you about yours? Sure, ask. How did you and Marlene end up together? He rolled his eyes. I met her at a Chamber of Commerce event. She came up, introduced herself, and we talked for the rest of the evening. I called her the next day, and when we met again, it turned out we just hit it off. It was amazing. Everything I liked, she liked. Everything I liked, she liked. We were perfect for each other. Nope. And when did you start talking about something more permanent? He thought for a moment before answering. She may have said something first, but I was the one who was eager to settle down. I couldn't believe someone so beautiful and talented could be so compatible, and I didn't want to let her slip away. So you really didn't know her that well. Well, I thought I did. We were talking about our past, and she told me she was divorced when we started dating. He seemed like a real jerk to me, and I thought she did the right thing by deciding to break up with him. How long were you two dating before you got engaged? He bowed his head in embarrassment. To tell you the truth, we were married six months after we met. He raised a pleading gaze to her. She told me that she wasn't interested in all the social trappings of marriage. She said it was just commerce exploiting fools in love. She wanted to run away, and that suited me just fine. So right after her divorce was finalized, we went to the justice of the peace and tied the knot. It all seemed so exciting and romantic at the time. She sat in silence, mulling over what he had told her. Finally, curiosity took over. So why did you want to know about her after all? I was just curious how you two ended up together. She stood up, yawned, and stretched. I'm really tired. I think I'll go to bed early. I'll see you in the morning, Wes. He stared at the door to her room as she disappeared inside.
What's this all about? He muttered to himself. The next morning, Wes's phone rang early. Mr. Hardaway, came a woman's voice. This is Winston Samuel's office. Mr. Samuels would like to know if you can meet with him this morning? Sure, sure, Wes replied, standing up. We could do it in about an hour? Okay, great, I'll be there. He stood up and knocked gently on Dash's door. She had obviously been up for a while, because when he opened the door, she was fully dressed. Good morning, Wes, she greeted him. So who was on the phone for you? That was your uncle's secretary. He wants to see me in an hour. Is it okay if I use your shower? He lowered his gaze to himself. I think your uncle would appreciate it. Dash waved him off and he hurried back inside to shower, shave, and put on fresh clothes. When he came out, he was thankful to see that Dash had managed to buy coffee and croissants. You need two components of a good breakfast, caffeine and carbs, she told him with a smirk as they devoured the pastries. Walking down the hall to the lawyer's office, Wes found the receptionist already waiting for him. He's expecting you, she told him with a smile. Winston Samuel's face was stern as he invited Wes to take a seat in front of the massive old wooden desk. I've been negotiating with representatives of your former employer, he said without preamble. I must report that we were unable to agree on the $5 million sum you and I discussed. Wes couldn't help but feel disappointed. A hint of a smile appeared on the lawyer's face. However, I was able to negotiate a sum of $6.5 million with them. I hope that will be satisfactory. $6 million? You're kidding! exclaimed Wes. They'll also cover my fees, which is very good for you because they're not insignificant. Their only condition is that you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement and refrain from making any public comments about the deal or the firm. I hope that's okay with you? Wes smiled. For six and a half million dollars, I will gladly remain silent from now and forever. The lawyer gestured with his hand to stop his client. Before you start spending that money, don't forget that both the IRS and the state of California will get their share. After taxes, the amount you will receive will be about half the total amount. Wes thought for a moment, then smiled. Three and a half million dollars is a lot more than I expected. A higher figure would have been nice, but I'm not going to complain. Then his face became more sober. Regardless of the amount, I would prefer that you not tell the rest of your family. The older man looked at him triumphantly. I never discuss a client's business with anyone unless my client instructs me to do so. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Before heading back to the antisocial network office, Wes checked his cell phone and made a quick call. Then he hurried back. Dash was waiting curiously. So what did Uncle Winston say? He managed to keep a straight face. Do you have any plans for tonight? He asked carelessly. No, why? She replied, confused by the change of subject. Good. Then I'd like to express my gratitude for all you've done for me by inviting you to dinner. Have you ever been to the Firehouse restaurant? I'd love to go with you, Wes but the firehouse is one of the most expensive restaurants in town. Don't you want to go somewhere else? He grinned. Well, I've already made reservations. Besides, I don't think it's too expensive to say thank you to someone who's done so much for me. And I certainly don't think it's too expensive for a man who's about to get a quick and very good judgment on his lawsuit. Realization swept over her and she jumped with delight. Oh, Wes, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. Then she pulled back from him and her expression became concerned. A fire station? Tonight? Oh God, I don't have anything to wear, and I need to get my hair done, and... No, you don't. Don't need what? She asked in confusion. Don't change your hair. Why? I always thought you hated them. Well, it took me a while to get used to them, but now... Well, they suit you now. Okay, she said hesitantly. But... With those words, she pulled away from him and hurried back into the bedroom. A few minutes later, she reappeared. I still have some shopping to do. Damn you, Wes Hardaway, I don't even know if I remember how to do this. I haven't shopped anywhere but stores in years. She found her car keys and slipped them into her pocket. Stay here, she commanded. If anyone needs anything, take care of it as best you can and tell them I'll be back as soon as I can. With those words, she sprinted out the door and he had to close it behind her because she was already running down the hall. It was already dark when she returned, carrying several bags in her hands. After Wes let her through the door, she quickly disappeared into her bedroom. He checked the time and decided he'd better get dressed too. He found the only suit he had managed to salvage from the house and put it on, along with a nice shirt and a pair of dress shoes. Behind him, he heard, Well, what do you think? Turning around, he saw her standing in the doorway in an ankle-length black halter dress. He stared at her. Dash, is that you? He asked in surprise. Her face lowered. You don't like it? No, no, he shouted, rushing over to her. 
You look just amazing, like a model. I've just never seen you in such an elegant dress before. Relieved, she smiled slightly. I was afraid it was too much, but it looked so good in the store. He stepped back to take another look at it. The black fabric contrasted with her hair, and the silver high-heeled sandals completed the look. You're so tall, he marveled, and the dress really complements your figure. He lowered his gaze to his clothes. Now I'm wondering if I look good enough to go with you. She laughed, took his hand, and kissed his cheek. I would have let you know if I thought so. Now why don't you call us a cab? Later, as they were finishing dinner on the firehouse's brick-lined terrace, Dash took a sip from her wine glass. Then her face took on a serious expression. Wes, remember how I kind of pulled away from you the other day? He chattered happily, but his smile disappeared at her question. I remember, but it was my fault. She shook her head to interrupt him. It wasn't you, Wes, it was me. She stared down at the table. Remember when I told you about my marriage and how hard it was for me? He nodded. It really hurt me. She looked up at him almost helplessly. I haven't had a relationship with anyone since my ex left me. In fact, I haven't even been on a date since then. His discomfort was obvious. I'm sorry, Dash, I didn't mean to put pressure on you. I... No, you didn't. I just reacted instinctively, on autopilot. She half smiled. You know, when I first met you, I thought you were just another clueless husband whose wife had left him. But as I got to know you better, I discovered there's more to you than that. And it's not just that we have bad luck with exes. You're wise and funny and romantic. Maybe most importantly, you're loyal. Loyal to your wife and yourself. That's very important to me. She blushed and lowered her eyes. I guess what I'm saying is that if you wanted to kiss me again, I wouldn't run away this time. He looked at her triumphantly, then reached across the table to take her hand. Before he could say anything, a waiter approached them. Wes looked at him blankly. I think we're going to skip dessert. Dash blushed again. Marlene. While Wes and Marlene dined al fresco, Marlene angrily tried to contact Jack McKenzie. When he finally answered her call, she lashed out at him. What's this nonsense about bribing Judge Chalmers to give me a protective order? I thought you said the judge was your friend. Don't be naive, Marlene. In politics, friend is just another word for sponsor. When I went to ask him for a restraining order, he made it clear to me what a great act of friendship it would take from him to do what I wanted. But that doesn't matter now, he muttered. What are you talking about? After word got out about us, the directors of the agency called a meeting today and kicked me out. How can they do that? It's your agency. Yes, but the agency's bylaws say they can, and they did. And to add icing on the cake, the California Department of Revenue is sending an auditor to the office to look into our accounting. I'm totally screwed. Oh, Jack, I'm so sorry, baby. Yeah, but your Zari and a losing lottery ticket are worth the same to me right now. So how about you forget my phone number while I try to find a way out of this nightmare? With those words, he hung up the phone. Oh, shit, what am I going to do now? She moaned to herself. Wes. Are you sure this is where you want to go? The Lyft driver asked, dropping Wes and Dash off near the Samuels building. His two passengers were too engrossed in each other to pay attention to him. Waving hello to the night watchman, they hurried to the elevator and made their way up to the sixth floor, hugging each other tightly. Once she let them into Dash's office apartment, he reached for her again, but she fought him off. Wait here, she told him before slipping away to her bedroom. I'll just be a minute. He was checking his smartphone when he heard her voice behind him. You can come in. He hurried to her bedroom door and stopped, stunned by the sight before him. The room was lit by several candles, and in the center of their soft light stood Dash. They had had an incredibly good time that night. The next morning, he woke up early and lay on his back, thinking. After a few minutes, he got up and got dressed, being careful not to wake her. He then quietly slipped out of the house. When he returned, Dash was already awake and was getting dressed as well. When he walked through the door, she looked at him apprehensively. What's the matter, Wes? She asked. Where did you go? I just needed to take a walk and think for a while. What were you thinking about? She asked, trying not to show how worried she was. He walked over and sat down across from her, a serious expression on his face. This whole experience of losing my marriage, my home, and my job has got me thinking about the future. It all seemed so clear and straightforward before. Now I'm starting to question what I want to do, where I want to live, everything. He saw the uncertainty on her face and tried to explain. You know, I'm not originally from Sacramento. My father was in the Army and stationed at Fort Collins when I was born. I grew up in Colorado Springs. After my dad's last heart attack, we moved here because my mom had relatives in California. Now that she's gone, I have no family here. Actually, I realized this morning that I have no ties to Sacramento left. 
He picked up his cell phone. I got a text from my realtor that she's expecting an offer on the house any day now. He stopped sipping the coffee she'd poured him, so he didn't notice the expression on Dash's face. I lost my job, of course, he continued. Not that I really liked it. Thanks to your uncle getting compensation from me, I have some time before I have to start looking for another one. And when the divorce goes through, it'll be my last association not only with Marlene, but with Sacramento. He shrugged. I mean, it's not a bad city, but it's nothing special if you know what I mean. She managed to nod, but her face resembled a flower beginning to wilt. I've been thinking about all this and I think I'm going to leave, start fresh somewhere else. Maybe I'll go to the Pacific Northwest. It's supposed to be beautiful there. Anyway, he paused awkwardly. I'm sorry, Dash, I know I'm not very good at this. What I'm trying to say is, is there any chance you'd consider coming with me? She was prepared for the worst, so it took her a moment to come to her senses. You? You want me to come with you? For how long? He looked uncomfortable. Well, as long as you want, really. But how long do you want me to be with you? Yep, really, I don't want you to ever leave. She gasped, wrapped her arms around his neck and didn't let go for a long time. Finally, he unclasped her hands and pulled away. I know it's a lot to ask, Dash, to leave your family, your job, and you really don't know me that well. It's just... Shut up, she interrupted. Wes Hardaway, your only problem is that you don't understand when someone says yes to you. With those words, she kissed him again, and he finally realized that she no longer needed to be persuaded. For the next few days, the lovers revolved around each other in a veritable bubble, almost oblivious to the presence of other people. However, the change in their relationship was immediately noticed by the other ladies on the floor and became a constant source of amusement. Even the two brothers realized what was going on and began rolling their eyes whenever any of them noticed the couple. But eventually realities intervened, forcing both of them outside the bubble. Wes had to consult with Winston Samuels several times about the divorce. Marlene suddenly became reasonable, and the issues that had threatened to delay the divorce were quickly resolved. Wes was greatly relieved that their separation could go through without a bitter fight. All that remained was to finalize the sale of their home. To avoid waiting, Wes arranged for Winston to handle the closing on his behalf. Winston also prepared the paperwork for Wes to sign in connection with the settlement with his accounting firm. Wes was thrilled with the outcome, but still decided not to say anything to Dash, at least not yet. In turn, Dash had work to do for several clients, the most important of which was her father. Cautiously, she went to his office to inform him of her plans to leave with Wes. Dash, are you sure you want to do this? He asked. I can't help but remember what happened when you ran off with Joey. I just don't want you to get hurt again, that's all. She tensed, expecting a confrontation. It's not the same at all, Dad. I'm much older now and much more careful about my emotions. Besides, Wes is the exact opposite of Joey. No crazy impulsiveness, no wandering eye, no drinking problem. When we went out to dinner a few nights ago, the only drinks we had were a couple glasses of wine with the meal. I know, her father said, surprising her. I've studied it. When she made a grimace, he asked, What, did you think I was going to let that guy get that close to you and not check him out? I almost lost you once. I'm not going to risk it again. She started to object, but he interrupted. Wait, you haven't heard what I found yet. He smiled encouragingly at her. Anyway, everything I've been able to find out about him matches what you just said. He's tough, reliable, intelligent, and hardworking. Despite what that harpy where he worked said, the other people in his firm like and respect him. And that's not all, Dash. He was a faithful, devoted husband. The only thing I can reproach him for is being overly naive about Marlene. But if a man can be wrong, let it be on the side of faith in his partner. Leave cynicism and suspicion for the likes of me. In any case, I think you've chosen a good candidate. I'd hate for you not to be here, but if you want to go with him, I'll bless you. Oh, Papa, she exclaimed and threw herself around her father's neck. He hugged her tightly, realizing full well that it had been a long time since she had called him Daddy. When he released her and she returned to her chair, he gestured toward where the law offices were. I'm glad you two won't have any financial problems, unlike Joey. However, I'd hate to see you close your business. You're really good at it. I know I rely on you, probably even more than you realize. She laughed. Just because I'm going with Wes doesn't mean I'm going to stop working. Basically, I can continue my business from anywhere as long as I have a laptop and a high-speed internet connection. She grinned. You're not getting rid of me that easily. I'm very glad to hear that, Dash. Then the smile left his face. Now I've learned something else I want to share with you, and Wes needs to hear it too. Maybe he can join us? Puzzled, she went in search of Wes. When the two of them returned, Trevor came over and sat on the edge of his desk. 
I've learned some interesting news that may affect you both. Word is that Jack McKenzie, your ex-wife's lover, has been ousted from his agency and is under investigation for possible tax fraud. Wes shrugged. Well, I'm certainly not going to waste any tears on him. That's not all, Trevor continued. I've also learned that he and Marlene are no longer dating. Furthermore, from what I understand, they don't even talk to each other anymore. Wes and Dash exchanged glances. Okay, he said firmly. Dash looked at her father questioningly. This is all very interesting, Dad, but why make such a big fuss? The detective looked at the couple standing in front of him. It's not what happened that matters, it's what might happen next. Wes, your future ex's scheme failed. At this point, she has no prospects of getting a new lover or selling her work. I think she'll try to make up with you. What? sighed Dash. Good luck with that, Wes waved her off. I wouldn't touch that woman with a ten-foot pole either. Trevor nodded. I understand, but don't underestimate her. If she wants to, she can put the brakes on your divorce quickly. She can have her attorney raise objections and delay the sale of the house. She can petition the court for family counseling, which could drag on for months. Dash told me about your plans to leave town. You have to realize that Marlene could put all of this off for an extended period of time. But why would she do that? asked Wes sharply. For one thing, the longer you go without a divorce, the longer she'll have a place to live and a source of livelihood. On the other hand, the delay means she'll have more time to try to reconcile with you. The longer you are married, the more time she has to develop a new plan. On the other hand, if she becomes aware of your financial arrangement, she could extort money from you in exchange for authorizing a divorce. What a bitch, exclaimed Wes. You don't know the half of it, Winston replied. Let me tell you what else I found out about her. When he finished telling what his investigation had uncovered, both were stunned. As they walked back to Dash's anti-social network office, Wes's face was white with anger. Dash was worried, for she had never seen him so testy. What are you going to do, Wes? She asked almost fearfully. What I'd really like to do is strangle her, he replied firmly. Seeing Dash's reaction, he quickly pulled her to him. Don't worry, babe, I'd never do anything like that. But after everything she put me through, I'd like to repay her somehow. She looked at him thoughtfully. I think I know someone who might be able to help us with that. He looked at her with a puzzled expression, then broke out into a smile. Gertie! They both shouted. Let me send her a message and see if she'd be interested in another installment of the humiliated hubby saga, she suggested. It was only a few seconds before the phone produced a reply. She read it, grinned, and turned the screen so Wes could read it. I want it, I want it, I want it. Read the reply message. The two of them quickly got to work, putting the information Trevor had found into a form that Gertie could use on her show. They had been working steadily for a couple hours when Wes's cell phone rang. Dash saw the name on the display and the angry expression that flashed across Wes's face. She decided to go to the bedroom to give him some privacy, but she could still hear the angry notes in Wes's voice. When it seemed like the call had ended, she walked back out. As you suspected, it was Marlene, he told her. Looks like your father timed it right. She wants me to meet with her tomorrow at our house to go over a few final details that she says need to be settled in person. She's also dropped a few hints that make me think she really wants to talk about a possible reconciliation. I? And I told her that I would need to get back to her. The big question is, how soon can we get this information together for Gertie, and when can she show it on her channel? If we can get it to her today, I bet she'll want to work with it right away. It might mean a late night for us, but I think it'll be worth it. Let's do it. Okay, I'll let Gertie know our plans. Great, he said. I'll call Marlene back and tell her I can meet with her tomorrow afternoon. Hopefully Gertie will have plenty of time. Dash grinned and picked up the phone. Judging by her reaction, I don't think you need to worry. Marlene. The next afternoon, Marlene was nervously checking herself in the mirror when Wes drove up to her in a lift car. At first, she was surprised, but after a moment, she realized that this could be good for her. Worst case scenario, I'll drive him back to his apartment. Best case scenario, he'll stay the night, she calculated. By the time he got up on the porch, she was already holding the door open, not even thinking about the irony of her action. When he entered, she tried to kiss him, but he pulled away. Don't rush things, she scolded herself. She gestured for him to take a seat on the couch in the living room and sat herself in the chair across from him. So, do you have the papers we need to sign? He asked. I do, she replied, spreading them out on the coffee table. But before we get into that, there's something I need to tell you. Wes, I just need to apologize to you. I've made some big mistakes and treated you very badly. This whole divorce thing is like waking up from a bad dream. I don't know what I was thinking. I was selfish and cruel, and I don't even know why. 
All I know is that I wish I could somehow make it up to you. He started to speak, but she hurried to continue. I think it was the prospect of selling the house that made me realize what happened. She smiled slightly at him. We had so many happy times here, when we were full of hope for the future, full of love for each other. Now I can't bear to lose that. She leaned forward, smacking her lips, a tear glistening in the corner of her eye. Wes, do you think there's any way to get that feeling back? Can't we start over? We don't have to sell the house. And honey, if you were willing to try, I'd spend the rest of my days trying to make you as happy as you deserve to be. He looked at her coldly. Let me get this straight, Marlene. You want me to forgive you for cheating on me for an unknown amount of time? Forget about the restraining order you put on me? Forget about locking me in my own home? Honey, I know I've treated you horribly, done terrible things that have hurt you and ruined our relationship. I honestly can't explain why I've done those things. It's like I've gone temporarily insane. But Wes, I've come to my senses. I realize how good we were. I remember how sweet our life together can be. Please, baby, let's not throw the good with the bad. He looked at her incredulously. Are you out of your mind? He growled and she flinched. Let me make this perfectly clear to you. I'm an accountant. I deal with assets and liabilities. And you, Marlene, are a huge liability in my life. The sooner I get rid of you, the happier I'll be. Now, if you'll hand me the papers I need to sign, I'll go. And with any luck, it'll be the last time I see you again. Shocked, she handed him the papers the real estate agent had left behind. As he took them, she noticed that a car had pulled up to the house, its engine still idling. He signed out quickly, got up and went to the door while she tried to find anything that might give her a chance at a relationship with him. But before she could think of anything, he turned and smiled grimly. Have you ever heard of the gossipy Gertie? He asked. She couldn't help herself, she shuddered. I think you should read her latest program. You'll find it very interesting. With those words, he opened the door and walked out to the waiting car. Everything okay? asked Dash. He nodded and smiled. Everything's fine. When they drove away, Marlene hurried back to her computer, logged onto YouTube, and found the Gertie's gossip channel. She watched nervously as Gertie began her introduction. Then behind her back, a computer-generated banner insert appeared on the screen. Humiliated hubby, the rest of the story. Hey, gossipers, judging by all your tweets, you all want to know more about the humiliated husband and his not-so-decent wife. Well, now Gertie has the latest chapter in the story for you. As you may recall, it turns out that Janetka wasn't seeking a divorce because of spousal abuse. Oh no, she wanted out of the marriage so she could have an affair with her lover. She even got her lover to bribe a judge to issue a protective order against her unsuspecting husband to make him look bad. Pretty chilling, isn't it? But wait, that's not all. Gertie wanted to know more about this conniving woman, so she did a little digging with the help of some of her admirers. You know who you are. Anyway, guess what? Janetchka wasn't an innocent caught up in a passionate affair. It turns out that this whole marriage was a scam that she pulled off with not one, not two, not three, but five hapless husbands. That's right, our hero was actually husband number five, but he didn't know it. It seems our cunning Janetchka, let's call her Mrs. Machiavelli, had come up with a clever little scheme. Marlene's picture now took up the entire background, and it was labeled Mrs. Bra Machiavelli. She would find a suitable sucker seduce him into marrying her, and then divorce him when she found a richer target. This little scheme Mrs. Machiavelli pulled off over and over again, and each time she perfected her technique. Before our hero, she had used the blocking scheme on her husband. Then, to make her plan even more effective, she added a restraining order to her scam. And it would have all worked if some of Gertie's gossipy friends, you know who you are, hadn't gotten wind of it. This time, it seems Mrs. Machiavelli's latest scheme has been thwarted, her candidate for husband number six is currently unavailable while he's dealing with a tax audit. And what about husband number five, our hero? One of Gertie's favorite gossip columnists informs her that he's headed off into the sunset with someone special. And from what I hear, he's no longer humiliated. Before we wrap up this saga, I want to share one last bit of savory news with you. It seems there are some angry ex-husbands in California who would like to have a chat with Mrs. Machiavelli. It turns out that the first few times she dissolved her marriage, she didn't bother to get a divorce. She just, ahem, allegedly, cleaned out the poor man's savings and left town. In closing, let me offer a word of advice to Sacramento men. Beware of Mrs. Machiavelli. She's probably already on the lookout for the next sucker. I mean, husband. If you fall for her, don't say I didn't warn you. Now let me tell you about a certain Hollywood starlet who... No! screamed Marlene. No, no, no! She slammed the computer shut, interrupting Gertie's annoying voice. 
But before she could think about what to do next, her cell phone rang. Realizing it was one of her friends calling, she answered it. Hi, Marlene, came the voice on the line. Or should I say hi, Mrs. Machiavelli? Throwing the phone across the room, Marlene screamed, God, I've got to get out of this town! Wes. They had only traveled down the I-5 freeway a short distance when Wes glanced at Dash. I was thinking, instead of taking the interstate, why don't we take the 101 and drive along the coast? How's that for an idea? Hmm, a leisurely drive along the coastal highway, charming inns and coastal towns along the way. Sounds scenic and romantic. Let's do it. He reached out and squeezed her palm. Sure, the drive to Seattle will take a lot longer, but we're in no hurry to get anywhere. Well, as long as we get there before our funds run out. We'll have to look for work once we get there. He looked at her oddly. I don't think we need to worry about that, babe. And then it hit him. Oh yeah, I never told you about the compensation I received, did I? You said it was good. He blushed. Well, pretty good. Six and a half million dollars. Her mouth dropped open. What? But after Uncle Sam and the state government get their share, it'll only be half that amount. She was still stunned. That's amazing, Wes. Why didn't you say something before? I didn't want you to think I was using the agreement to get you to like me. She rolled her eyes, and he hurried to continue. Besides, it's not social media money. I mean, it's not even as much as Gertie makes in a year. She looked at him sternly. Wes Hardaway, I don't care about the money. And as for the internet, let me worry about that. My job is to use social media to fulfill the needs of my clients. Her eyes were sparkling now. Reaching up and placing her hand on his zipper, she added, your job is to take care of my needs. Do you think you can handle that? He smiled cheerfully at her. I can handle it, Dash Daniels. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.